Peace Steve Reinhardt. I'm your host. Beat the Place, three Saturdays a month, where Utah's culture, history, politics, and religion collide. It's New Year's Eve. I'm happy to be here. We've got a great show for you planned today. We're here to discuss Mark Hoffman, one of the greatest forgers and murderer here in the state of Utah. He's a prolific counterfeiter, and he's currently serving a life in, in the state of Utah. Hoffman was a dealer in antique items. He forged and altered coins, book historical banknotes to make them more valuable, often by just simply adding signatures. And he became famous for his discoveries of previously unknown documents pertaining to the Latter-day Saint movement and the LDS Church. During his career, Hoffman fooled some very renowned people. Among them was David Lombardo, a curator for a library of material written by Emily Dickinson. Hoffman sold him a newly discovered manuscript, a copy of an unpublished Dickinson poem for $24,000. The document was later determined to be fake. Lombardo remarked at the time, Hoffman was one of the most skilled forgers in this century. The lengths he went to fool all the experts were extraordinary. Uh, before Hoffman's criminal career was exposed, some of his discoveries were presented to Kenneth Rendell, one of the top experts in the United States and one of the men responsible for debunking the forged Hitler diaries. Like others doped by Hoffman, Rendell initially dismissed the documents as forgeries, but later pronounced them consistent with their claimed origins. Now we have an author of a book, which I read several years ago about Mark Hoffman on the line. We have Alan Dale Roberts with us, who wrote Salamander, the story of the Mormon forgery murders. There have been several books written about this subject. This was one of the better ones, I thought, although there's people who claim that it has some weaknesses, which we'll talk to the author about. We've got him on the line. Let me get set up. We'll go to him now. Alan, are you with us? I am. Thank you for being on the phone with us today. We're, we're happy to have you here. It's a privilege to come on the show. My privilege as well. We realize it's been a while since these, these murders happened, since these documents were forged. You used to speak a lot about it, but uh, things have slowed down lately. There's been, it seems, almost a renewed interest in this string of crimes lately. For what reasons, I'm not entirely sure, but NPR's recently done stories on it. There's a movie being made about uh, this whole episode right now. Are you uh, finding that people are asking you about this, uh, this crime again? It seems to be a story that never goes away. About two or three months ago, there was a four-day conference held by a group of forensic examiners uh, at a hotel here in Utah, and the whole conference surrounded the Hoffman story, the documents, the means of discovering that they were not authentic. Uh, there were a lot of people there. There were new books out. Uh, as a result, there must be now six, seven, eight maybe books. Um, so it's, uh, I keep getting questions, requests for um, copies of the book. So I, I don't know why the renewed interest. I think it's because it's been the 20th year anniversary of the murders back in October of 1985, and uh, the Tribune and uh, other other publications have had articles on the story, so it could be because of the 20th anniversary of the events. Now, you're an attorney here in Salt Lake, is that right? No, I'm an architect. Oh, you're an architect. I apologize. And you're a uh, journalist uh, formally. Uh, only informally. I've written articles for lots of magazines and uh, journals, but I'm, I've never been an official journalist or done that full-time. I'm a full-time architect. Well, you did a great job with your book. I found it to be the most informative of the several that I've read. Unfortunately, it's no longer in print, but you can still buy it on Amazon.com and at Sam Weller's. There's copies of it floating around all over. Will it eventually be reprinted? Do you think you'll do a third edition at some point? Uh, it was printed, uh, I think there are at least five editions that I know of. There were a couple of hardbound editions. There were several paperback editions. It was the number one bestseller in the Intermountain States during the year 1988. And uh, it must have sold 80 to 100,000 copies, I think. Uh, it was also a Pulitzer nominee. And you can get copies from places like Benchmark Books as well. So I, I don't know whether they would republish it. I think uh, if there's a huge demand, but I, I don't know why they would be at this point. So I think they'll continue to sell out the uh, uh, editions that are left. And after that, I don't know. Well, we have a number of questions we'd like to ask you about the Hoffman murders in general and about uh, your book specifically. But before we do that, can you give us, we introduced the topic yesterday on the air, told people who aren't familiar with the story a little bit about it. Can you give, give us a quick three or four minute summary of who Mark Hoffman was and what he did? And then we'll start to get into specifics. Mark Hoffman was born of German parents who were uh, Mormons. Uh, his father 
was quite strict uh, about what could be talked about in the home. I really didn't like to discuss uh, problems that Mark saw with religion. So according to Mark's closest friends, he became an atheist at around age 13. Um, I think he had sociopathic behavior uh, in his childhood. He, he did things that are pretty much classic, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, bad behaviors. Uh, and then as an adult, uh, the checklist of those behaviors is filled out again. Uh, interest in incendiary devices, uh, 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 fascination with you know, uh, cruelty to animals, and lying, and uh, uh, you know, putting mint marks on coins and sending them out to be authenticated. Uh, and uh, clearly, he was beginning this career as a forger uh, early on. Probably had considered it even before his LDS mission to England, where he collected a lot of uh, ancient materials, sent it back in boxes, and. Uh, his forgery career actually began in the mid-1970s in terms of documents coming forth, and they were fairly crude, but then he learned how to do 19th century calligraphy. Uh, I agree with your comment earlier. I, I believe uh, that he was the best forger in the history of forging that's ever been caught. He, his skills leapfrogged ahead of the ability of forgery detectors to uh, find them to be uh, forgeries. So you mentioned Kenneth Rendell. Uh, Hoffman sold maybe half a million dollars of his own forgeries to America's two leading forgery detectors, Kenneth Rendell and Charles Hamilton, who between them had written over a dozen books on forgery detection, and yet they themselves could not detect these as forgeries. Uh, some of them were truly ingenious, and I could go on with the details on some of them if, you, if you'd like. But as, you know, he was as good a con man as he was a forger. And so he was able to fool virtually everybody, Library of Congress, Antiquarian Society, uh, LDS church historians, uh, forensics experts, uh, his, you know, just, just all the way across the board. He really took in everybody, Alan Russ, the coin dealer. Uh, there was virtually no one that, that uh, uh, was beyond his ability to fool with his forgeries. And initially they were... Uh, innocuous in terms of the content, uh, friendly, if you will, uh, Lucy Max Smith letter, uh, the Book of Mormon contract, things like that. But as he got further into his career, the forgery started containing uh, problematic zingers, sort of historical anomalies, uh, pieces of information that were uncomfortable, and he was able to exploit the faith versus history conflict that, that was felt in the LDS Church at the time. Uh, so you have documents like the Salamander letter, the uh, money digging letter, uh, and documents like that that portray Joseph Smith in a in a uh, light uh, different from the traditional history of the church. And then he was able to uh, persuade church leaders uh, to buy these documents uh, uh, secretly and put them away in the archives. And he promised never to divulge the content, but at the same time he would type up the uh, transcripts of the content and send them out anonymously to people. So there was a great controversy raging during this uh, early 1980s period about his documents. I myself had given papers on various of his documents. Uh, he would he would pay to have them authenticated himself and bring in independent authenticators. They would look at the ink, the paper, the signatures, the historical content, the postmarks, the postmaster's names, how they were folded. Uh, and he got all of that right. He learned how to take uh, galatonic ink and age it so that it looked like 150-year-old ink that has sort of a sepia color. And that ended up being his downfall because George Throckmorton and William Flynn, the two forensics examiners, we were able to uh, discover under microscopes an alligator ink effect on the surface of the ink that had more extensive cracking than naturally aged ink. And finally, they were able to take any stack of, of documents and separate out the authentic ones from the Hoffman ones. And in the back of our book, there's an epilogue written by George Throckmorton where he analyzes 21 of these documents and ex explains how they were able to finally determine that they were all forgeries. But there was a time when nobody uh, was finding these to be forgeries. And because they were authenticated, then the content became, in a sense, true. Uh, in fact, he often himself talks about how 
his ideas became true and were published in books, were quoted, and became a new historical fact by virtue of the documents having been authenticated. So uh, finally you get to the point where he's uh, also uh, forging American documents, oath of a free man being the most significant of those. Uh, he actually made two of those that we know of, tried to sell them each uh, for about a million dollars, and he was counting on this income. Uh, it, didn't, it didn't come in on time, so he was able to use Steve Christensen to have General Authority Hugh Pinnock secure an uncollateralized loan for 184000 which was a bad business decision, uh, to say the least, but Hoffman uh, was supposed to then take this money to buy the McClellan collection, uh, a fairly large collection of, of writings, journals, and other material from William McClellan, an early LDS apostle. Uh, some of these writings were said to be critical of, of Joseph Smith and the church from an insider's perspective, and so again, there's the potential for damaging information. The problem is Hoffman never did forge the documents, and in fact, the LDS Church later discovered it actually owned most of the McClellan collection and didn't remember that it owned it. And the other part of it was in Texas, but he was not able to produce it. And there was continual pressure at this point from Steve Christensen, uh, church leaders, and other people uh, for him to deliver the, the collection or give the money back. Uh, but he, he was not careful with his financing. It was definitely not a business genius. Uh, so any, anyway, the murders occurred as uh, sort of a decoy uh, attempt to take take the uh, spotlight off of him and put it somewhere else so that he, he could buy some time to get out of this problem. Now, George Throckmorton disagrees with that. Let me throw the phone numbers out really, really quickly. Uh, sorry, 254-5855, Ogden, 670-5855, Pro 470-5855. We're on the line with Alan Dale Roberts, author of Salamander, The Story of the Mormon the murder forgeries. Your, your description has been very detailed. Well, there's questions we have about all sorts, all of these things. Real quickly, NPR did a, an interview with George Throckmorton, and he thought that, uh, there, that the, the assumed reasons that Hoffman may have murdered Steve Christensen and Kathleen Sheets are, are, are wrong. He has some new theories about that. We'll be, do you mind holding on with this? We'll be, we have to take a quick commercial break. Yes. We'll, be, we'll be right back. We've got Alan Dale Roberts on the phone with us. We're talking about the uh, Hoffman murders. Uh, you with K-Talk. You and Reinhardt. We'll be right back. AM 630 KTKK. My folks always say, time is money, gotta look at what you love. My mom was working late again last week, working to help me rearrange my bedroom. This week, she's working late to help me with my science project. <laughs> work, 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 that's my mom. They work at a list, they work at a play. They work hard and let me know. I'm okay. My dad was up at the crack of dawn yesterday, so we could go fishing. And this week, he'll be working every night, working with me on my math, history, and English. Spend something in your family that shows them what they're worth. Spend your time. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For ideas on spending time with your family, visit family.mormon.org. Credit is like playing the violin in public and learning the instrument as you go along. Hi, Mark Marine here with Marine Credit Systems, the car dealership where you kick the dealer, not the tires. When buying a car, those of you with good credit should take advantage of the same rules the bank demands of those that don't. For example, the bank will not only check but double check the book value and the validity of all the options on the vehicle you just bought. So if you're driving a Dodge Neon the bank thinks has four-wheel drive, a lift kit, and sliding doors, your credit is so good, no one checks. You've been power booked. Go to markmarine.com or call Marine Credit System. 467-9980. 467-9980. Welcome back. 
I'm Steve Reinhardt, your host this Saturday. We're talking to Alan Dale Roberts about the Hoffman murder and forgery crimes that uh, took place in the 80s. It's the, it's the 20th anniversary this October of those crimes. We've got him on the air here with us. Are you still with us? Yes, I am. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to ask you a, a, a couple of questions. As you discussed, and as I mentioned earlier, Hoffman's considered to be one of the greatest forger, if not the greatest forger of the last century. But in an interview that I heard just recently, someone who went to high school with him called in and said, they don't understand how he could possibly be perceived as this genius, because in school they all thought he was the dumbest guy in the class. So he actually graduated in the lowest, a lower third of his class, but at the same time he was going to high school, he and his friend Jeff Salt and perhaps others were already doing research up at the Western Americana section of the Marriott Library at the University of Utah. And one of the breakthroughs in the case was uh, when I went up there and went through the call slips. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me if, if he has these historical um, documents that are found by experts like Leonard Arrington to be authentic, where did he get all the information? And some of the information was new. Where did he get it? And uh, finally, his, his longtime friend, Jeff Salt, explained it, that they would go up to the U and do research. So I went up, checked out the call slips, and found the documents that he had checked out starting at about 1976, and found where he got the content for a number of his documents, but more importantly, also found that in addition to using his own name, he was also checking out material under the name of uh, Mike Hansen. Mike Hansen was the name he used to, to buy the bomb parts that killed two people. And so he had a history of, of using pseudonyms to uh, uh, take people off his track at, at many years before he actually did the bombing. This was an important thing to the police in developing their case. But anyway, he was categorically bright. Uh, I can tell you about any particular forgery, but one, let's just talk about the, uh, the uh, uh, Book of Mormon contract this, this was a document was, that was known to have existed, but nobody ever had a copy of it in modern times. 1830, Brandon Company, printing company, there was a contract to print uh, 3,000 copies of the Book of Mormon. And, and uh, Hoffman came up with the contract. It was uh, uh, authenticated. It was written on 1830 paper. It had watermarks from the 1830s in Palmyra. Uh, he was able to basically steal a blank page out of a of a book from that period. Uh, everything about it was right. The, the, the handwriting, the amount, the, the content was correct. Uh, a friend of mine who works for the LDS Church was investigating it one day and noticed under a microscope he could see little shadows on the backside. He turned it over and under a uh, close microscope he was able to see uh, imprinted on a diagonal across part of the page an advertisement for the Grandin Company from 1830 that uh, was embedded in the, in the reverse of the document without ink. So it looks like the document had been placed on a, on a, uh, a crate of typesetting and then something had to be put on it and the, the, uh, uh, this, this ad appears. And so he looked up the ad and sure enough it was similar to an ad that appeared then. I mean, it, it, those subtle touches were so extraordinary that uh, he had people totally convinced that these documents were authentic, and that's that's just one example. On the other hand, the longer he did this, the more careless he got, the more lazy, if you will, the more cavalier. I think he thought he was invincible at some point, so the Spanish book co-op notes that he did that appeared in Alvin Rust's book on coin and currency were, were printed with modern ink that was not invented until after 1950. Uh, Al Rust didn't know that. He thought they were authentic, but people like George and William Flynn were able to uh, find some of his less uh, ingenious uh, forgeries. He was really desperate for money at certain times, and, and some of the stuff he turned out was not so good. Well, let me throw the phone numbers out. Tell us 254-5855, Ogden 670-5855, Provo 470-5855. Would you agree that the oath of the Freeman was probably his most carefully crafted forgery? Not necessarily, because, because I know some of the other ones that, that were uh, incredibly impressive as well. But it was, it was more important because it was America's earliest printed document. Again, it was known to have been printed, but no one in modern times had a copy of it, uh, or let alone an original. 
So he man manages to come up with a six by six inch broadside. He's able to create the right kind of uh, typesetting that they use, including a special kind of the ascenders and descenders for letters, like the letter P has a descender and so forth. And he, he got them right so they didn't overlap. He got the ink right, uh, got the paper right. Uh, the Library of Congress was, was persuaded that it was authentic. Did, uh, Alan, can, can, can you, we'll have to take a quick commercial break. And hold on, we've got a couple of callers with questions for you. Sure, of course. We'll, we'll be right back. You'd like our call at 254 We'll be right back. Take up. KTKK. Hey, Dex. Hello. How's everything going in the pantry? Oh, I'm fine. Canned goods are fine. Cereal's fine. Shelves are fine. We're all fine. <laughs> What's that over there? Uh, just some recycling. What's that on top? Uh, some phone directory. Oh. Well, wh why are you recycling it? Because I have you, Dex. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Really? You know more real estate agents than restaurants and accountants and kennels and mold inspection slash removal specialists and fish hatcheries, equipment and suppliers, and yoga instruction and barbers and computer dealers. Go on. And comedy clubs and car rental agencies and chimney sweeps. Dex, no one has more accurate local business information. No one has more current listings. And no one has more ways to get the most complete local information available. In Spanish, on CD-ROM, or at DexOnline.com. So, uh, what you use that for? for lots of things, supplies, water, paperweight, kindling. <laughs> Go on. You get the idea. Dex, the one that gets used. Dex knows. Watch for your new Dex Salt Lake City Yellow Pages, coming to your door soon. To get additional directory or CD-ROM, call 1-800-422-8793. Like a little product? Let's talk business. Door lock self stores is a good business decision. Call 566-8900. Gain extra office space. Increase retail sales space. Enjoy clutter-free work environment. Organize important documents. Access your store seven days a week. Could your business use a little room to grow? Many storage sizes to choose from 5x5 five five to 10x25. Door and lock is convenient, saves you money, and be secure. Door and lock, 8620 South, 300 West, or call 566-8900. That's 566-8900. When life becomes cluttered, stuff it at Door and Lock, 566-8900. Make sure you heard this ad on K-Talk Radio and get a free lock or storage supplies. That's 566-8900. Door Lock. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt, your host. This is, we have Alan, Alan Dale Roberts on the phone with us, author of Salamander, the story of the Mormon forgery murders. Are you still with us, Alan? I am, and I, I should tell you, and your listeners, that this book was co-authored by myself and Linda Silito, and they had been a writer for the Desert News who was covering the story at the time. I should have mentioned that. Yeah, and she I, and I, I were trading information back and forth, and eventually she decided to leave the news and uh, go ahead and join this, this uh, research and writing effort with me. In my opinion, it's the, the most comprehensive, the, the most interesting book written uh, on the uh, murder forgeries. We have some callers who have questions for you. Let's take a Let's go to uh, Ryan on line four. Ryan, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for calling into the program. Hey, I just had a couple questions. Uh, it's Mr. Robert. Yes. Hi, Mr. Robert. Hey, I just had a quick, a couple questions. First one is, uh, I read the book The Mormon Murders about a year ago. Yes. And I tuned in a little late. I don't know if you guys have discussed that. How did you feel about the book? I mean, did you feel that it was an accurate portrayal? No. It, uh, in what way? It was uh, it was written by a couple of uh, attorneys back east who write uh, sort of pop sociology, pop psychology books. They have a book called Why Don't Men Open Up. Um, they take on sort of popular stories and they come in and do a quick quick job and write these short books. Uh, I knew the guys that wrote it. I read the manuscript, read the book. I think it's inadequate in a lot of ways. I don't think their research was, was deep. I think they had preconceived conclusions that they brought to the table and tried to prove those rather than letting the evidence speak for itself. And, and I, I think uh, this is not just my opinion. Everybody that I know that has read that book 
uh, as well as ours. And a uh, third book was uh, Robert Lindsay's book called The Gathering of Saints. He was the New York Times stringer uh, uh, living in San Francisco. He wrote a book. Uh, all, all of these books came out uh, a year or two after ours did. His book was very short also, but, but much better much more responsible in terms of his methodology and his conclusions, his use of evidence, and so forth. So I think the smith Nafee book, The Mormon Murders, uh, is is just full of wild speculation. And I don't think they liked anybody in Utah, the, the, the victims, the per perpetrators, the church, anybody else. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, to be honest, there aren't a lot of people too like in the whole story, if you get right, right down to it. Uh, the LDS church was uh, certainly guilty of a lot of things, and the people who were uh, uh, greed and uh, trying to get, uh, you know, documents either for glory or for money. So now my, my other quick question for you is, is, why do you, who do you think the third bomb was for? And uh, there's a part in the book where it talks about Christensen and him having this argument the day before the, the Christensen bombing. I just was wondering, if you could talk a little bit about the bombing, who you thought did it, and do you have a Mormon bias? I mean, are you just strictly down the line, just going to tell the Mormon story, and and that and paint Gordon B. Hinckley as just this uh, perfect uh, man who did everything right, or But let me try to an answer them anyway. Uh, neither Linda nor I have a, a, a pro or anti-Mormon bias. Our whole objective was to be uh, as honest uh, with the information, as comprehensive with our research, and uh, ne neither one of us are. Uh, uh, active Mormons, uh, we, di we didn't want to, uh, we didn't come in with preconceived ideas. Uh, we weren't trying to paint the church with any particular color or brush or anybody else. In, in, in terms of using uh, information from Hinckley, for example, I went to Dallin Oaks, uh, asked for interviews. He said they don't do that. Uh, I asked if he would answer questions in writing. He said he would. I promised that if we got answers from, uh, from Oaks, Hinckley, and uh, Pinnock, that we would quote them in context verbatim without without interpreting them and allow those documents to speak for themselves. So we prepared a couple pages of about 12 detailed questions. He answered them, uh, Gordon Hinckley answered them, and Hugh Pinnock answered them. They all answered them separately. It did not look like they ran into correlation or anything. They all signed them, sent them back to me. Uh, we uh, used them as we said we would. Uh, so we had no agenda whatsoever. Uh, in, in doing the book. In terms of who the, the third bomb was for, at the time we wrote the book, and our opinion really hasn't had a reason to change since then, we believed that the bomb was for Brent Ashworth. He believes so as well. Uh, he was in the conference a couple months ago on the Hoffman documents and spoke. I think he still maintains that the third bomb was for him. He had an appointment with Hoffman right after the, the, uh, the time that the bomb accidentally went off in Hoffman's car. And uh, I think most most serious students of this story believe that the third bomb was for Brent Ashworth. And let me just say, the really the only criticism that your book has received is that it, in fact, has a little bit of an anti-Mormon bias. I actually heard George Dog and Throckmorton criticizing your, your book and a couple of others. He doesn't believe that the LDS Church influenced the prosecutors, you suggest in your book, to give Mark Hoffman a cushy plea deal. No, no, we don't say that. We say the opposite, really. Uh, maybe George doesn't understand. Uh, we we think well that the the Mormon Mormon Murders book uh, suggests that there was some kind of conspiracy between the church and the Mormon uh, prosecutors to to uh, control the outcome of of the story in a certain way. We we don't see any evidence of that. In fact, we know that when subpoenas were given uh, to certain church historians to collect uh, evidence, that there was lack of cooperation for some period. And there was there was some uh, uh, I, I think there were some legal uh, wranglings behind the scenes where the, the church really didn't want to join with the police and and making things uh, available initially. I think finally they did, but I, I, you know we we don't see the church as being guilty of conspiracy. I, I agree with the caller in the sense that the church's issue with faith and history their paranoia about historical documents that, that color Joseph Smith in a, in a blacker uh, palette. I think their concern with that led to their uh, buying documents uh, secretly and uh, denying they had them 
uh, certainly they did some things that yeah, that were uh, poor in, in judgment, if not encouraged Hoffman to do the kinds of things that he did. Please, please stay with us, Alan. We're, we're, we've got some cars with questions that really like to ask you. We'll be right back against the board, Stephen Reinhardt, 254 talking about the Hoffman murders and forgeries. Sorry, 254 AM 630 KTKK. Come join us at the Best Western Cotton Tree Inn in Sandy. Whether it's a romantic getaway in one of our honeymoon suites or a weekend family outing relaxing by a 24-hour pool and hot tub, everyone will be sure to enjoy our full hot breakfast. Here with Ace, Hatch Friends, Belgian Waffles, French Toast, Food, Tasters, and much more. We also offer fresh baked cookies, free husky wireless internet, a fitness center, and shuttle service. We are conveniently located by many shopping centers and numerous restaurants. Happy reservations today. 801-523-8484. That's 801-523-8484. Be sure to mention the PayPal Radio Listener Special Discounted Rate of $69. Best Western Cotton Tree Inn is located at 106 South Automall Drive in Sandy. 801-523-8484. Copy your reservations today. 801-523-8484. That's 801-523-8484. Hi, I'm Linda Bills with Keller Williams Realty. I've got a system to sell homes called the Simple Selling Solution. I offer flexible commission rates, and if you're not happy, you can fire me. Mind you, I think you will be happy because my average time for selling a house is 22 days faster than market average. And most of the homes sell for 98% of list price. I'm not trying to brag. I'm simply applying for a job. I want to be your realtor. Fact. I sell 29 times as many homes as the average Salt Lake agent. That's a house every four days. You see, while other agents are out looking for buyers, the Linda Bills team talks to over 200 buyers every month. Find out why. Don't sell your home until you call for my free information package. 347-3384. Flexible commission, no upfront fees, and you can cancel any time. The simple selling solution. Our system is your solution. 347-3384. Linda Bill, 347-3384. Would you like to earn a guaranteed 6.7% on your money with no state income tax? Would you like a more secure financial future? Hear the truth about investment. Tune it to Bill Battaglia on the American Advisor Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. right here on KPAR. Get your daily to learn the fundamentals of investing so you can protect your family from losing stocks and a falling dollar. You will learn what's happening to the economy, how to create a diversified portfolio, and how to prosper in any market environment. Show also provides valuable information on 401k and other retirement accounts and provides practical advice on protecting the purchasing power of your savings account. Call in and you'll receive a free silver coin. Tune in to the American Advisor with your host, Joe Italia, Monday through Friday at 3 o'clock, right here on KTOP, the voice of Utah. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt. You're with KTOC. Salt Lake 254-5855. We've got Alan Dale Roberts, author of Salamander, the story of the Mormon forgery murders on. We're talking about Mark Hoffman. Uh, Alan, can we uh, go to a call quickly? Sure. Uh, we've got David on, in Sandy on line 3. David, are you with us? Yes. Thank you for calling the show today. You're welcome. I'm Mr. Roberts. Are you a former uh, resident of Utah? I'm, uh, I am was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I came out here to go to school, uh, to go to college, and I've lived in Salt Lake City now for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, did, now, did you say that uh, Lindsay's book was, was uh, quite a cut above uh, uh, Smith and Nathan's book? I, I believe it is. And mm -hmm. well, the, the church also had a book written by Richard Turley, the attorney that took over the church historical department from Leonard Arrington. And uh, it basically, it was, it was called The Victims. And it's very long, very detailed. And their, their book came out sometime after ours. So that was the fourth major book. Uh, the Tanners wrote kind of an uh, insider published book, mm -hmm. the Vanity Press book, and now there's some newer ones. Um, our goal in writing it was to not only appeal to the, uh, the Utah Mormon uh, audience that had a, a great amount of detail about the story and reading it in the paper every day for months, 
and had a great need to know and a lot of familiarity with the religious jargon and so forth, but it also make it appeal to the non-Mormon out-of-state audience and not confuse them too much. So it was sort of a delicate balance between the two. But if people, on the one hand, think it is too pro-church and others think it's too anti, then clearly uh, we, we sit in the middle or someplace. Uh, the New York Times book reviews reviewed it, and, and they thought it was very really balanced, very really objective. So I, I'm not going to make a declaration about it. I, I think readers need it to think for themselves. Do you feel like the Chinese book, uh, or, or, or what, what the man of murders did for the for the prosecution, do you think that uh, Turley's book was equally guilty for the, de uh, for the, the same crimes but for the defense? <laughs> I think the, the Turley book was written in the interest of the church. It was written to deflect uh, uh, attention from the church's role and try to portray them as victims rather than as being culpable in any way with the outcome. I, I think they, they clearly didn't want to uh, admit any responsibility for anything that happened in the story and uh, wanted to portray Hoffman as, as darkly uh, as possible and make him sort of the evil murderer, you know, atheist, anti-Christ, anti-Mormon, you know. And uh, uh, I think, again, the readers need to, to take a look at each book, weigh the evidence, decide for themselves what they think is persuasive. Um, I'll, I'll, I think the things in our book are truthful. That was our objective all the way, to be accurate, to be truthful as far as the information we had went. We had a lot of information. We interviewed, I don't know, 400 people uh, for hours and hours and hours. We uh, spent 27 months researching and writing and editing the book. In the last editing, we cut out over 100 pages of content. It was just too long. The, mm -hmm. the book is about 556 pages long as it is. It's very complicated, and we could have gone on and on and on. But, um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, we tried to be honest. We truly did. Mm -hmm. I, I, I felt like it was pretty accurate, too. One last question, Mr. Roberts. If there was uh, problems for Hamilton and Rundell, you know, and, and uh, the redoing flaws in their techniques, if, as good as they were, wouldn't that even pose more problems for the church uh, since Rundell and Hamilton didn't claim to have a pipeline to deity or revelation? And I'll, I'll hang up with an answer. We get this question a lot, and the, que the a, a restatement of the question is if, if church leaders are inspired by God, why, did, why weren't they inspired to know these documents for forgeries? That's a religious question. That's a question that hinges on faith and the nature of revelation and what is it that God says to prophets and do they tell them what breakfast cereal to have and what pant leg to put on first or, or is revelation limited uh, uh, to, to matters of faith and morals as, as Catholics talk about in terms of the Pope? I think Spencer Kimball and Joseph Smith have both said things like a prophet is a prophet only when he speaks as a prophet. So I'm not going to get into that discussion because it's a theological one. Uh, the leaders depended on Hoffman's integrity. Uh, they also depended on independent examiners who were fooled by Hoffman. They had people like Donald Schmidt who worked for the church historical department and the historians of the church were used to authenticate and uh, basically all of the resources that the church had combined, uh, whatever they were, uh, were not able to detect these documents as forgeries. Quite the opposite. Uh, people like Leonard Arrington were still maintaining they were authentic. There were six documents he, he swore were authentic, even after the forensic examiners uh, convincingly concluded that they were not authentic. But he was convinced just on the content alone. So uh, everybody was thrilled. Hoffman was an equal opportunity a con man got everybody. And this is a story that anti Mormons love to use against the church to try to mm -hmm. to try to uh, make you know, portray them in a negative light. But tell me what loose ends are still missing from the Hoffman story. He never has actually said that Brent Ashworth was the intended victim for the Well there is there are some loose ends and they're important. As part the reason that this was not a capital crime and that he did not face execution is because his attorney Ron Yangich uh, worked out a plea bargain agreement whereby Hoffman was uh, sentenced to life uh, rather than the death penalty in, in lieu uh, or in exchange for his testimony uh, about all of, all of the documents and his career and, and, and details about what he did and why. And he's doing without parole, life without parole, is that right? Yeah, I was at a sentencing hearing where the parole board 
uh, reviewed the uh, date at which he would be eligible for parole, and they basically threw away the key and said, there is no date in the future where we, where, when we would consider you even eligible for parole. parole. Life in this case means life. Of course, that could be reversed by a later parole board, but I doubt it. Um, so basically, he agreed to debrief uh, attorneys with information about his career. He started to do that, and there is a manuscript uh, that starts with the beginning of his forgeries and goes a couple of years into his career, and then he stopped uh, granting these interviews and never uh, honored the terms of, of the agreement, uh, and they haven't been able to force him to do it. So he would not disclose the details about the murders. Uh, I was in the sentencing hearing when, when he was asked about the two murders that we know he did do, and he was completely cold-hearted and cold-blooded and unremorseful about it. He said it was a game to him that, that they could have been killed walking across the street, that you know mortality isn't that important. Uh, he said three times or so it was just a game. Uh, Kathy Sheets, it could have been the milkman, the paper boy, it could have been one of the kids that picked up the bomb. It really didn't matter to him as long as somebody picked up the bomb. And I've never, I mean, it was chilling for me. I never felt so... Uh, I don't know, uh, a person so isolated from his humanity is when I heard him telling the parole board that, that it was just, just fun and games for him. It didn't matter who he killed or how or why. It's, it's chilling to hear this. He tried to commit suicide twice in prison, from what I understand. Right. Uh, at least he gave the impression that he tried to commit suicide. He's, you know, we did, we did not get to interview him, nor did any of the other authors. His attorney would not allow anybody to interview him, and no one has ever interviewed him as far as I know. So there are a lot of uh, documents uh, uh, that he, they, I mean, the reason George Throckmorton continues to be involved is new documents keep being discovered that are under a cloud of suspicion, and he's brought in to determine whether they're authentic. Uh, Alan, we'll take another quick commercial break. We want to try to get to a couple of cars, more cars before the top of the hour. Thank you so much for being with us. We're talking about the Hoffman uh, murders. With the author of Salamander, the story of Mormon forgery murder, Psych 254 KTKK. This is Rick Kerber, and I am the free capitalist. I want to tell you about a different kind of mortgage company. The founders of Innovator Mortgage understand the principles of prosperity economics. Innovator Mortgage specializes in helping you maximize the return on the equity in your home. Using innovative equity management strategies and advanced mortgage planning, I recommend that you call Innovator Mortgage today at 801-687-1511 to meet with one of their equity management advisors. 801-687-1511. Now mention Free Capitalist Radio and you'll receive a free equity analysis. Don't be associated. Call Innovator Mortgage today. 801 801- 687-1511. This is Rick Kerber, and I am the Free Capitalist. Remember the fun you had as a child on Christmas Day? What memories will your child have this year? Build your child's memories with a gift from Hammond Toy, Hobby, and Dolls. For 50 years, Hammond's has been the home of the finest toys, dolls, and telescopes in the land. Imagine your child's excitement when they open a toy from one of these fine companies. Build the Hot Wheel Collection from Mattel. Now only $1. Thomas the Tank Train by Learning Curve is always a favorite. Challenge your siblings to a disc golf game from Innova. Kids love to see their hands into Hasbro's Play-Doh. What could be more cool than a Lego Bionicle set? Remember to buy extra rail back batteries for non-stop fun. Hammond Toy, Hobby and Dolls has been selling Christmas memories for over 50 years. With stores located in Cottonwood Mall, Valley Fair Mall, South Town Mall, University Mall Orem, and Newgate Mall Ogden. There's a Hammond Toy Store near you. Visit your Hammond Toy Store today. So are you coming with me or not? No. Do you ever find that someone else is breaking with affecting your life? Don't quit. Does it ever make you feel angry? Don't yell at me because you're mad at your mom. She's the cook, not me. Do you ever feel depressed or sorry for yourself? I'm going to have to cancel it, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm trying to drink it again. Yeah. 
Or does it sometimes make you feel frightened? Why are you clicking again? You feel okay? I think it's your ears picked up. Someone each other back at home. No matter how you feel, if someone's drinking is affecting your life, we can help. We're Al-Anon family groups, and we know what it's like. To locate an Al-Anon or al team group in your community, call 1-888-4-AL-ANON or visit our website at al Remember, to help them, you have to help yourself first. Welcome back. I'm Steve Reinhardt. This is the place on Saturdays where you tell culture, history, politics, and religion collide at 1 o'clock. We've got Alan Dale Roberts on the phone, co-author of Salamander, the story of the Mormon forgery murders. I uh, need to thank our call screener, Trevor, really quickly. We're getting all sorts of crazy, raving people calling, and he's doing a good job filtering them before they get through. All right, Alan, let's go quickly to um, Kay on line two. He's been waiting quite a while. Kay, are you with us? I am. Thank you for calling the program today. How are you? Just fine, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and um, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just have a comment. Um, I happen to be out of the rug, mm-hmm. and um, it, it's my understanding that sometimes the violator of the law needs to be proven out to the end of what they're capable of, and I believe that Hoffman uh, continues to the end to deceive, and I do not know, you know, I, I can't know whether that was ever um, prayed about by the general authority, um, but but I do understand that when people choose to violate the laws, uh, sometimes the Lord does allow that to carry through, and unfortunately, there are sometimes there are victims in that, we most often. We appreciate that comment. We only have just a couple minutes left on the, on the program. Mm-hmm. Did you have a, any quick questions, or was, was, was that your comment that you wanted to make? That was, that was just it. That was I, 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 I'd like to agree with your point. comment about his deception to the end. I, I think this was his nature, and you might want to uh, consider that he passed the lie detector test uh, early on uh, in the investigation, and this lie detection test had four different components that measured respiration, perspiration, so that he was so, so good at lying that when they uh, conducted this test, his body didn't distinguish between lying and telling the truth. And I think for him it was pretty much the same thing. And I think his whole whole life, his whole career was built on an incredibly complex web of, of uh, deceptions, lies, frauds, forgeries. Uh, it's who he was, uh, and I, so I think that part of your comment has proven out. Thank you. Thank you for the call, Kay. Great, great comment. Hey, we only have a couple minutes left on the program. Let me ask you just a couple of rapid-fire questions. Mm-hmm. This interview will be online for people to download if they want to. It'll be up. Uh, it'll take about a week for it to get there, but hopefully people can refer to it later. Really quickly, was Hoffman is a historical genius as much as he was a, a forgery expert? He, he loved Mormon history, and he had that in common with Steve Christensen. In fact, uh, both of them were using the same archives on the same day, I found, when checking the calls book. Okay. And uh, they, they were both fascinated by the early, uh, you know, particularly the 19th century genesis of, of uh, the Mormon church, Joseph Smith, and uh, all the key figures. Okay, great. We have less than a minute left. Uh, about a minute. Um, was Hoffman planning on forging 116 lost pages of the book one? Yes, he was. In fact, the uh, investigators, when they broke into his laboratory, which was kept secret, by the way, from his wife and everybody else, they found notes uh, show, indicating that he was in the process of uh, forging at least some of those 116 pages. That He had Lehi, for example, portrayed as a, uh, a treasure seeker, money digger, kind of like he portrayed, often portrayed Joseph Smith as being. Which, which jived with the... Uh him going back to get the, uh, the plates of Laban and yeah. talking about his goal. Well, there, was, there were more anam- anomalies and singers waiting in 160 pages. He probably would have sold them off a page at a time for hundreds of thousands of dollars and made a fortune doing that. And, and didn't the church become suspicious of him when he made the claim or suggested that he had those? And, it, and did they possibly become suspicious of that claim because they knew more about the last 116 pages than we know? Yeah. I, I would speculate on that. So I, I, so I think they were suspicious of him mainly because of his really poor uh, uh, 
ability to meet commitments, uh, meet deadlines, come for, come forward with, with things he promised, make good on his financial promises. I think they were getting very suspicious of him as a businessman, not so much so as a forger. And we're, we're just wrapping up the program. I want to thank you very much for coming on the show today. You, you've been, it's been very informative, very interesting. Alan Dale Roberts, co-author of The Mormon Forgery Murders. You can buy it at Amazon or uh, probably find a copy of it at San Juan. Thank you so much for coming on the air. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. That's AM 630 KTKK. Pick up in the front lot. Good credit means the absence of money. I'm a big fan of money. I like it. I use it. I have a little. I keep it in a jar on top of my refrigerator. How much does it make us rich? Oh, no, not rich. But we're certainly better off than we were before. Bad credit means the end of it. Where's my money? Hi, Mark Marine here with Marine Credit Systems, the car dealership where you kick the dealer, not the tires. You've heard me say, don't sign blank documents. But what about what you should sign? The paperwork seems to be endless. Trade-in paperwork, title forms, odometer slips, as is sheets, bank contracts. Here's what I want to do for you. You can pick up a free package of all the documents needed to be signed in a car deal from me at Marine Credit Systems. It's all there, just so you know what to look for. Wow. Go to markmarine.com or call Marine Credit Systems. 467-9980. 467-9980. Hey, Margie, what are you doing? Hey, Jack. It's a little nippy, so I thought I'd make fine use of the fireplace. Hey, what's that? You're, <gasps> you're using a, oh, a phone directory for kindling. I know. But why? We, we do so much good. Mix, look at the cover. There, under the log, what do you see? <gasps> Just get to look. Well, I see that it doesn't say Dex on it, which tells me a few things. I'm listening. It tells me that it's not the most complete, that it doesn't have more businesses, more information, more of what I need. It tells me there's no reason to use it. Is that why it's in the fireplace and I'm under the sink? You are happy under the sink. It tastes great. I love Under the Sink. It's the best ever, Dex. The most complete directory in town is the most used directory in town. In fact, people in Salt Lake City turn to Dex nearly 75% of the time. It's got all the local info you need when you need it. Will I be in the fireplace one day? Don't be silly, Dex. Next year, I'll just recycle you. Comforting. Dex, the one that gets used. Dex knows. Watch for your new Dex Salt Lake City Yellow Pages. Coming to your door soon. To get additional directories or a CD-ROM, call 1-800-422-8793. The voice of Utah. The sound of freedom. AM 630 KTKK Sandy Salt Lake City. This is KTOP. CNN Radio, I'm Mary Ellen Hopkins. Northern California ends the year with a powerful storm that's causing massive flooding. Janice Atkinson with the Sonoma County Department of Emergency Services is telling people along the Russian River to leave the area. We are experiencing flooding across the county, not just in the river area, because many local streams and creeks have overflowed their boundaries. Um, we are advising people not to drive through any standing water. Several residents have been caught in floodwaters. Hillside residents are being warned to be ready to evacuate quickly. A violent end to the year in Iraq. Two American soldiers were killed yesterday. Another died in a mortar attack today. They're ringing in the new year in Moscow. The year celebrations are beginning in Baghdad as well. Earlier, the Pope offered a blessing from the Vatican. New Orleans is saying goodbye to one of the worst years in its history. New Year's celebrations included jazz funeral procession. A big change for New Year's tradition in California. This year, January 1st falls on a Sunday, and tournament CEO Bill Flynn says this brings up another tradition. One of the unique things is the fact that when January 1 ever falls on a Sunday, the parade moves to January 2nd, and that's not all. But in this particular year, it's going to be even a little bit more different because we are hosting the national championship. Uh, the BCS game, and that will happen on January 4th. So you're going to have the parade on the 2nd and the game on the 4th, which is good for the local economy. Oh, the hotels and restaurants and people staying a little bit longer is good for everybody. Jim Roop, CNN Pasadena. Crowds are already gathering in Times Square for tonight's big celebration. I feel very safe here. There's hundreds and hundreds of New York's finest NYPD, and um, it's the best city in the world. There have been no credible threats, but extra New York police officers will be on hand. The most trusted name in news, this is CNN Radio. Dallas, 
shotguns, like K-47s. The solution is obvious. When the citizens need help, they call the police. When the police need help, they call the SWAT team. Alex Ryan, the real life series that was you in the crossfire. We're going to see what's coming. There's no doubt in my mind. Dallas SWAT, Critter's jurisdiction, where he's been in a nice social home on a knee. There are two kinds of bikers. There's the tough, hardcore biker, like Smokey here. Hey, bro. And then there's the weekend rider, like Jeff. Hey, man. These two bikers couldn't be more different, except for one thing. You both have Geico motorcycle insurance. Because Geico covers most kinds of motorcycles, and they offer money-saving discounts. So, you see, you guys, you have more in common than you thought. We need for a free rate quote on motorcycle insurance, visit Geico.com or call 1-800-44-CYCLE. Geico Motorcycle Insurance. Let's ride. As you celebrate the new year, it may be time to think about New Year's resolutions. As celebrations ring out to bring in the new year, many are planning ahead with a resolution for 2006. Well, some aren't. Maybe be nicer. <laughs> yeah. No, not, not my husband. <laughs> or, or <laughs> it's a 50-50 thing. Some of the more popular New Year's resolutions spend more time with family and friends, getting fit through regular exercise, taming that bulge, Perhaps you've acquired it from the holidays, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, and enjoying life more. Ed McCarthy, CNN. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg officially begins his second term tomorrow with an outdoor swearing-in ceremony at City Hall. Bloomberg says he's learned a lot since taking office four years ago. Singer Tom Jones, whose hits include It's Not Unusual and What's New Pussycat, is now a knight. Other singers who hold the title in Britain are Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, and Elton John. This is CNN Radio. What's going on over there? This Sunday, the heart-stopping hit series 24 comes to A&E. How do we know this? Because they said so. I'm official? No, it's official. 24 is on A&E. Well, what does that mean? It means you can watch 24 on A&E. I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Okay. Watch 24 Sunday nights at 7, 6 central. There's no way I can do that, okay? Nothing but watch on A&E. There you go. I'm on my way there now. This holiday season is the perfect time to get XM Satellite Radio. Because now, XM radios are starting at just $50. XM is America's largest playlist of commercial free music and over 5,000 live sporting events. And if you activate any XM radio by December 31st, activation is free. Better hurry, this app is only good for the end of the year. Check out XM at stores like Best Buy, Circuit City, or shop at XMRadio.com. XM Satellite Radio. This is large. Please have to mail in rebate, and they vary by retailer. We'll apply for every subscription and hardware sold separately. Come join us at the first Cotton Cotton Tree on Sunday. Whether it's a nanny getaway one of our honeymoon suites or a weekend family outing, we're lasting by a 24 hour cool hot tub. Everyone will be sure to enjoy our full hot breakfast. Here's with eggs, hash browns, Belgian waffles, French toast, food, tasters, and much more. We also offer fresh baked cookies, free high speed wireless internet, a fitness center, and shuttle service. We are conveniently located by many shopping centers and numerous restaurants. Call for your reservations today, 801 523 8484. That's 801 523 8484. Be sure to mention the K Talk Radio Listener Special Discounted Rate of $69. Best Western Hot and Tree Inn is located at 106 Ninehouse South, Automar Drive in Sandy. 801 523 Eight four eight four. Copy the reservation today. 801-523-8484. That's 801-523-8484. Welcome to the Little Strasburg Show. I'm Steve Reinhardt. Linda suddenly. She's here. I hosted the last program. She's lost her voice. She has such a cold. She has. She. Uh, has requested uh, I don't I don't know if she's going to make it through the hour or not so I'm here Steve I'm going to do a follow up on my program from the last hour about Mark Hoffman and the Mormon forgery murders those of you listening know that we had Alan Gill Roberts author of Salamander the story of the Mormon forgery murders on and he was discussing I, what I would call an insider perspective on the uh, Hoffman story only because he knew so many of the people involved from the general authorities to the investigators to friends of Mark Hoffman himself. Uh, Trevor Bluford's in studio with me. What we'd like to do is we'll 
we're going to go over the documents one by one that uh, that Hoffman forged and what their significance was and how he became more and more brash in what he was doing. Let's throw out the numbers real quick just so people uh, can call in with Let's questions or comments. Uh, 254-5855 in Salt Lake and Provo 470-5855 and in Ogden 670-5855. The, the, uh, the, the interesting thing is I, I, I grew up in California uh, and I was in California in 1985 when all this went down. I really never heard anything much about it even though we would come up here all the time. So I, I guess Utahns kind of look at it as kind of like a, a major thing that happened but why did I was just a child in 1985 when he was prosecuted? And most of these crimes took place in 1980 through 1985. I'm still a young guy. And um, it was a huge story here. Even at that age, and, you know, I remember hearing about this story. And not understanding it entirely, but knowing that it was just something extraordinarily bizarre and evil that had happened. And this story, I don't know that it got a lot of national attention. You didn't hear about it in California. No. Other people didn't hear about it anywhere else. If you go to wikipedia.com on the internet, you'll see that it, even in Wikipedia, it says that it's remarkable that the story didn't get more attention. It's ironic, it's strange that it's now getting attention 20, 21 years later. Well, Hoffman kind of spread his wings. He didn't just kind of focus on Mormon relics or, or or historical documents. He, he did Abraham Lincoln, Emily Dickinson. It's amazing. And there's a movie being made that focuses on the Emily Dickinson angle. And this is something that I find so amusing. He forged a poem by Emily Dickinson, the greatest uh, American female poet probably uh, in, in the last century. And there are Yale and Harvard and, and English professors and English professors everywhere who study Emily Dickinson poems and talk about how genius they are. Well, this poem that he forged was published in Emily Dickinson anthologies. People thought it was legitimate. They talked about how it related to her other poems and what a work of brilliance this this newfound poem was by Emily Dickinson. It wasn't even written by by a famous writer. And only uh, after a few years later did did people find out that it had been forged and was it taken out of her anthologies. I think it continued to float around in her list of her poetry all the way through like 1997. For like 15 years, people continued to believe that they didn't hear that it had been forged, that this was one of her poems. It makes you wonder if there's really as much to this analysis of writing as these English professors think that there is. They, 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 they can't distinguish. Was it a good poem? I, I've read it. I mean, it seemed to be. It was interesting. But, I mean, apparently, these, these scholars who, who love these poems and talk about great writing can't distinguish between great writing and the writing of someone who is a scientist. It, it reminds me of, it reminds me of like watching Antique Roadshow and you see just some piece of crap trinket that somebody has. They bring it out and, and this collector or antique appraiser looks at it and says, do you realize what you have here? And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like saying, I, I'd sweep it under the rug. It's just, it looks worthless. And, and, the, the value assessed to some things just blows my mind. And, and when these guys who, they, they really pontificate on things, like, like this Emily Dickinson poem. It was looked at by scholars. It was, you know, researched, so to, say, so to speak. And they come and, and, and look at it and say, yeah, it was Emily Dickinson. And I don't know. It just, it, art and things that are so subjective, uh, you know, it's like, it's like judging ice skating. How do you really judge what a 10.0 performance is versus a 9.9 .9 performance, you know? It's just, to me, it's just kind of ludicrous. And, and the people out there who are into English and into these things are probably offended listening to us right now. But you have to wonder if it's really much, as much of a science as they like to think Well, of. I mean, you look at Mark Twain. And Mark Twain uh, was a literary genius. But, you know, his, his grammar wasn't perfect. It wasn't, uh, he, he was no Charles Dickens, but yet he's, he's revered as the same. And, and I think it has more to do with just how people feel when they're reading it rather than how important it is or how self-important it is. Let, let's, let's talk about a couple other things that deal with Mark Hoffman. Now, we don't have time to get into it with Alan Dillon Roberts, but he theorizes, as almost everybody has, that Mark Hoffman killed Steve Christensen and killed Kathy Sheets and was about to kill Brent Ashworth. And there was, no, there was another, there was another uh, person in the say he wouldn't have gone on killing had he not been caught? I mean, he obviously forged. Well, they think that he killed these people 
to try to cut, because these were people who were about to discover that his documents were forged. He was doing it to prevent his discovery and to prevent financial ruin. And there was the mayor of Springville, I can't, I can't remember his name, but he was into collecting Mormon documents. Some people have, have wondered if he was the third victim, but, or intended to be the third victim. But um, George Throckmorton. You almost wonder if maybe he was trying to become a victim as well, just because it would kind of put him out of suspicion of the other two. I mean, well, he killed, he killed Steve Christensen because he knew Steve Christensen was about to expose him. He then killed Kathy Sheets, who's the wife of Gary Sheets, for no other reason than to make Steve Christensen, Christensen's murder look like it was related to his CFS financial venture. Right, he's he's not about forgery. Steve Christensen, he is uh, the son of Mac Christensen, the uh, Mr. Mac. That's right. Clothiers. That's right. But Throckmorton, who is a detective, a forensic detective that was on the case, and continues, as Alan mentioned, to analyze new documents that come forth from Hoffman to discover if they're forgeries or not. From what I understand, Hoffman sold 1,200 documents during the time, during those few years in the 80s, some of which were authentic. He actually found and sold. They were minor documents of not great and yeah, important. I think that doing what he did, he'd come across something at some point. Uh, and people, but people now wonder which of these are forgeries. And uh, the, some of them are, are so clever, it's, it's very difficult to uh, to tell. And so throughout one has become the, the man who, who, who tries to, to decide whether they are or not. Well, in your interview with uh, Robert, he, uh, he said that under the microscope, they're starting to be able to discover things like the alligatoring on the ink and stuff like that, where it just, it, it's more aged than what should be, you know, it looks valid to the naked eye, but now that they're going at these things with the microscope, they are able to discern whether or not they're forgery. So do you think people who have bought things in the past and maybe have passed them on, that people who have them re-verified? I, I, I heard Blackmore interviewed on KUER uh, recently, and he said that all old ink cracks. Sure. But his ink, that was the one, that was the old ink. The thing that they've been able to identify in his forgeries is it's more cracked, super cracked, than than it than it should be. Yeah. And it's cracked in a little bit different pattern. In the forgery process, that's the one thing that that uh, that's not perfect. So it's like in uh, you can you know replicate paint, you know being cracked. You know they have crackle paints and stuff like that. So all of these processes are known. It's just a matter of how they're applied and and you look at and, and so. Do you think people are going to be re-verifying their documents? Well, they have been for, for 20 years, and then, and so that's why he continues to be a man of interest in the whole thing. But one thing that I thought is that he just wrote a book, and what he says in this book and what he says in his interviews is that he doesn't think that Hoffman was killing these people to try to prevent discovery and try to prevent financial ruin, which is just the, the accepted reason that he's been doing it. He thinks that Hoffman was actually doing it out of revenge, because, and frankly, this theory doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. I, I think that it's really just some supposed new light that he's trying to shed on the whole thing, just to his books. But uh, apparently, people still getting upset with Hoffman. He owed them money. Uh, they were angry with him. And so, I don't know who it was, but someone actually, uh, I think it may have been this guy in Springville, got so upset with him that they hit him and threw him against the bookshelf and roughed him up a little bit. And for some reason, Throckmorton thinks that this, like, switched a, a fuse off in Hoffman's brain. He was just used to people getting mad at him or kind of putting up with him. He wasn't used to these small-town people who don't handle things as, in as civilized a fashion as these other people, like general authorities that he's used to, to dealing with, and it scared him. And, and somehow in Throckmorton's head, he thinks that Hoffman started trying to eliminate the people, or the Hoffman, yeah, excuse me, Hoffman tried to eliminate the people who he thought were treated that way. That's Throckmorton's theory. I don't, I don't really buy it necessarily. I think it's much more likely he was just trying to prevent the discovery of his forgery. You know, it's interesting. I mean, had Hoffman gotten away with a lot of this stuff, he might have been, had targeted general authorities in the church, you know, including uh current president Hinckley, because Hinckley was one of the people that dealt with him directly, was he not? Uh, only on one occasion. Uh, I, I don't know if he would have gotten that brashly, because he didn't want people to connect him to the, uh, to the murders, which is why he killed Kathy Sheets almost as a distraction, but nothing more. She was nothing more than a thief. Well, I understand that she was meant, not. it was her husband that was meant to be killed, not 
hurt herself, aggravated. And then he testified, though, that he didn't care who got killed. He just he just wanted it to be believed that, you know, that the bomb has been sent to their house. He didn't care if Gary got killed, if Kathy got killed, um, whoever. But I, I don't know that he would have gone after Hinckley, but people have wondered if he would have gone after Elder Pinnock, Hugh Pinnock. So what did he do with all his money? I mean, he... He seemed to always have money problems, but obviously he was getting money for selling these important documents. Well, he he didn't make as much money as people think. He had a deal inked with the Library of Congress to sell them the oath of the free man for a million and a half dollars. Now, what is that oath? Oh, yeah, what is that? Let me throw the phone numbers out really quickly. Say 254-585-4070-5855, August 670-5855. I'm Steve Reinhardt. I'm here in the studio with Trevor Bluford. We're filling in for Linda Strasburg, who uh, we, we got done with our program last hour, and she was here, and she's struggling so much with the cold and her voice that she just can't speak. So we're uh, doing a follow-up on our show from the hour. Four of us to do her job. No, uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Spare the moment, talk radio. Um, what did you ask me? The the oath of the Freeman. Okay, what, what the, was the oath of the Freeman? When the Mayflower came over from Europe, it had a printing press on it. It's known to have printed several documents, only a couple of which are remaining. I think the printing press was destroyed in 1668. But the first document that was ever printed on that press, we know, was called the oath of the Freeman. It's never turned up. It would be the first printed document ever. In, in on the American continent. So people have inklings about what it said, and there's a couple of journal entries that talk about it. Hoffman forged this document. He forged it perfectly. It passed muster with the best uh, uh, and that, uh, forensics analysts in the, in the world, you know, from the Smithsonian to, to you know, all sorts of other museums, and the Library of Congress agreed to purchase it for a million and a half dollars. And uh, it, they were just arranging final details about how it would be shipped over there. He had the letters perfectly forged to match letters that we do have, that we do know what they looked like from that particular press. I mean, it, it was just amazing the, the extent that he went to. And according to Throckmorton, they wouldn't know that document was forged even today had they not found the equipment that he used to forge it. It's perfect. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, we have a call on line two from George in Provo. Let's uh, let's go to George on line two. George, with us? Two, two names that uh, I haven't heard, uh, Martel Bird and uh, Paul Jensen in, in this scenario. Is those names ringing the bell at all? Yeah, why don't you tell us about them? See, we've lost the expert. Now, Alan uh, left the program at the top of the hour. Oh, okay. So it's just well, it's well, just well, well, Paul Johnson served uh, nine years in the uh, federal kind of penitentiary down in uh, Las Vegas at the uh, federal penitentiary there for uh, his, his marriage and understanding. He's going to finish the money uh, for all this stuff. He, at one time, he had all the documents at his home. I know this man person who's been in my home. Uh, Martel, um, Martel Bird was the top security man for the church at that time, and he was involved deeply in that. And he knew, uh, before it ever happened, what, who, 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 who was doing what. George, could you hang on the air with us here? We're going to go to a commercial break real quick, and we'll be right back. All right. Is that right, George? Interviews and interactions. Linda Strasburg on K Talk. We're back. I'm Steve Reiner in studio with Trevor Bluford. We actually missed that quick commercial break. We're we're filling into Linda Strasburg's spur of the moment. She's the host normally on at this time. She lost her voice and asked us to uh, to fill in for this hour. So we're doing a follow up on last hour's program. Are you still with us, George? Yes, I am. So continue with what you were saying. So this now. I'm not familiar with the information you're showing with us right now. I'm sure that uh, Alan would be where he's still on the uh, the phone. So this guy's in jail in Las Vegas. Why is he in, in Well, he's been out for a couple of years. But he, he was the man who left the checks out. He was a huntsman of his, of his ear. He didn't put the huntsman on the... Uh, the he didn't put uh, his name on the side of the airplanes and he was fired from the general authorities and the uh, missionaries and the... Uh, uh, Tabernacle Choir around. He, he didn't want his name on the airplane. Okay. But he was a huntsman of his, of his year. He was a billionaire. What was his name? Paul Jensen. And, and so he was jailed for his involvement with this, uh, with this string of crimes. He was in jail 
uh, for knowing too much, let's put it that way. He, he furnished the money. To Hoffman to buy the McClellan yeah. collection and the right to do it. Uh, and, uh, and he actually, uh, uh, well, I better back off that. Well, what's uh, interesting is Hoffman seemed to have kind of a, an aim and a desire to to discredit the church. And it, from what you're saying, it sounds like Jensen was a, a friend of the church. Well, that's true. I'll say he was. He supported it. Uh, right up to the time he left to go to jail. So was Jensen another person that was deceived by Hoffman, or did they work in, in cahoots? Well, he was deceived, yeah. And what was, what was the official crime that he was charged with? Uh, he owned a bank in uh, South Dakota. Well, he was worth four and a half billion dollars when all this stuff started unraveling. Um, he had 17 airplanes in his uh, fleet of airplanes. Uh, Which guy? 737 was his uh, was his plane that he fly around. He come up from Houston. He was raised in Provo, uh, Salt Lake. Uh, but the time when the uh, 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 motion picture studio here in in Orem, uh, was going bankrupt, he was. Uh, directed to buy that because uh, it protected individuals, and so he bought it. Uh, what well, was the name of the mayor of Springville at the time this all was occurring? Lord Springville? Well, he was involved in something I've forgotten his name, only because I'm not I, I had him ring a bell to me. But there's, there's things I can't talk about, and that's why I've stopped in the middle of some of this stuff. But, well, why why is it you can't talk? Are, is there like a court order gagging you on that? No, no, nothing like that. I just have respect for the people. They live in my world and, and this and that, and I just don't. Well, the entire event caused problems for all sorts of people. People died over it, yeah. and people went to jail. I, it's just it's just extremely unfortunate, and at the same time, fascinating in retrospect to analyze. We thank you for the call very much. Yeah, the husbands and wives, uh, some of them don't know anything about these things. Wow. So you yeah, have to just stop at a certain point. We understand and appreciate that, Joe. Well, hopefully, hopefully the information comes out sometime and uh, yeah. people get the entire story. Well, it's there. It's there for anybody who wants to research it. It's all our, uh, the, the one fellow, he was the top security man at the church. He died within a few months after all this stuff happened. And that in itself is extremely interesting the way he died. So, but it goes on and on. Well, I hope there's answers sometimes. Thanks, thanks, thanks for the call, George. You bet. And Steve, you were talking about on one of your previous shows how Utah has its wealth of super criminals, and you, talking some, you mentioned something about how there seems to be a, a high morality here, but for some reason the there's something with honesty that isn't being well. It, it's something that I've wondered about. Let me let me tell you about it. First, let me tell you the farm. Two five four five eight five five. Probably four seven zero five eight five five. August six seven zero five eight five five. Sure, and I have flown in for Linda Strauss, but she lost her voice at the last minute before she went on for this hour. We're going to follow up on last hour's show. I have wondered what, along the lines you just said. Utah has one of the lowest crime rates in the country. I think it's actually third lowest. It's not quite the lowest. There are people there who said, in fact, it's the lowest. The reason it's only third lowest in the polls is because the prosecutors here prosecute so aggressively they end up prosecuting crimes for which people otherwise wouldn't be prosecuted. I mean, if they had prosecuted every single marijuana case in California, people do do time for things here they wouldn't even be charged with in California. But despite the low crime rate, there is a kind of said its share of so super, the, super criminals. Huge. It's the one of the highest though for like fraud, like mortgage fraud. Utah's. You know, we'll talk about that in just a second. Some of the some of the other uh, famous Utah criminals in the eighteen hundreds. You had obviously Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. They're so old they really don't even apply to modern uh, life anymore. But. D.B. Cooper, who parachuted out of the 727 that was flying out of Seattle, was never found. He ransomed all the passengers. Six months later, an identical hijacking occurred for which a Provo BYU student was arrested in 1971, Richard Flood McCoy. He was tried and found guilty and given 45 years for the second hijacking. There was a book by Bernie Rhodes. Let me write back. Uh, talk about this. AM 630 KTKK. 
Life a little clutter? Let's talk business. Door and lock self-storage is a good business decision. Call 566-8900. Gain extra office space. Increase retail sales space. Enjoy clutter-free work environment. Organize important documents. Access your storage seven days a week. If your business needs a little room to grow, many storage sizes to choose from 5 by 5 to 10 by 25. Store and loss is convenient, saves your money, and be secure. Store and loss, 86 20 South, 300 West, or call 566 8900. That's 566 8900. When life becomes cluttered, stop it at Store and Loss, 566 8900. Make sure you heard this ad on KTOX Radio and get a free lock or storage surprise. That's 566 8900. Don't let your next car deal be sold to you like a movie ticket. The big profits are in the goodies. Hi, Mark Marine here with Marine Credit Systems, the car dealership where you kick the dealer, not the buyers. Let's talk about the profit made in a car deal for the dealership. All I want is my money. Let's talk about the front end profit and let's talk about the back end profit. Don't forget the money, Emmy! Front end profit is the money the car dealership makes between the cost of the car and the sale price of the car. Back end profit is the money made by the dealership on interest rates and the goodies. That is a lot of money. Get pre-approved at Marine Credit Systems and prevent your next car deal from being a movie ticket. Go to markmarine.com or call Marine Credit System 467-9980, 467-9980. Welcome back. My name is Steve Reinhardt. I'm in studio with Trevor Blue, but I have a show at 1 o'clock on Saturdays where we explore Utah cultural, historical, political, and religious topics. Linda Strasburg is normally on from 2 to 3 o'clock. She lost her voice at the last minute, so Trevor and I are happy to so in forward we're doing a follow up on the uh, one o'clock show about Mark Hoffman. We're talking about some other issues as well. I was talking about famous Utah criminals in addition to Hoffman. We'll we'll come back to that subject in just a second. I want to talk about John Galanis and DB Cooper, Ted Bundy, Mark Hoffman's another one. Uh, uh, even the Zodiac Killer I've read some interesting things about his Utah connections. But let's go with Becky on line two. Yeah, Becky had some interesting things to say here. Becky, are you with us? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, um, before the Mark Hoffman broke, before he blew himself up in that car, um, I had I was working at a business here in Salt Lake, and one of my co colleagues, uh, her husband, came in one night. He was a seminary teacher, and he said, "I've got something to tell you, Becky." And I said, "What?" And he said, "You're not going to believe it." He said, "If I if I tell you something," and he basically told me about the family or Order. And he said, it's going to blow the church wide open. Uh -huh. He said, said there's going to be a lot of people's testimonies that are going to be ruined. By, <coughs> because, and this, you know. this was before it was, they knew it was a forgery, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And uh, I looked at him, and I knew he was a seminary teacher and a good member of the church. I was going to the church. And I just said, well, whatever it is, you know, it may look horrible now, but it has to be. It has to be a fraud. It has to be because, because I know it is. I know it is because that was my faith. Well, right. then, then a few months later, this this bomb went off outside by the old district gym, and where this guy named Mark Hoffman <coughs> had been injured. Well, my sister was a nurse at the LDS hospital the night they took him in. Interesting. And she said that all of the nurses were put on a gag order. They could not talk about it. But she said. One of the nurses had overheard had overheard that Mark Hoffman had um, killed people that he had uh, you know he made a confession more or less and of course that would ruin the prosecution case so they told everybody to be quiet but my sister told me <laughs> and I remember putting those two things together and of course little by little everything came out and I've been fascinated ever since. Well, I read I read the book but here here was the thing I think. Don't you think that Mark Hoffman, I mean, we're talking about terrible criminals in Utah, I mean, the worst. I think where Mark is the worst is, he, because it's religious, I think he's like, I don't know, he's kind of like Satan. He, he wanted power. 
he would love to see the end of the church. And I think he thought he was so powerful when he saw that maybe he was going to be caught out when he could bring down the Mormon church, just bring it down on its head. I mean, that's why he started killing people. I think he went into a rage. Well, we didn't have time to ask Alan Roberts uh, all the questions that we had for him. Uh -huh. Clearly, Mark Hoffman had three objectives. At one point, his objective was to kill people. At another point, it was to forge documents. And at, a, at another point, it was to cast doubt on the authenticity and the legitimacy of the Mormon Church. Oh, All a very diabolical, dark, murder, yeah. forgery, you know, discrediting a religion. One of the problems I see with the uh, discrediting of the church is why he would actually try to reproduce the Book of Lehi, unless he was trying to make it... I think he got so carried away with his self-importance I really think he began to hear Satan whispering to him, you can do this, you, you've done it. I almost, I think he was kind of like that. I think he finally thought, I can do anything. I can get away with anything. Well, so he, I think... He, there, there are a number of unanswered questions, and I, uh, I'm not somebody who buys into a lot of conspiracy theories, but there are people who, who have said, that he must have been possessed by the devil because he, one thing that no one's been able to explain is how he forged the handwriting of so many people. He forged George Washington's handwriting perfectly. Abraham Lincoln, Joseph Smith, Martin Harris, Sidney Reagan. How can we possibly have all these? Yeah, you and, wonder how he did it without help from the other world. And here's the thing. I never heard that story until you just said it. I've never heard anybody say until you just said it that he, some people think he might have been possessed. I thought of it myself because of hit the strange, the strange nature of everything. So I read quite a bit about it, and I followed it, well, and he, I just think he was the strangest creature well, on the planet. It was like, it was like everyone, Throckmorton and Dale Roberts and everyone else has said, he was a genius. Yeah. Didn't grew up with thought that he was you know, near mentally handicapped, but quite the opposite. And not just of forgery and science, but of history. The reason the Salamander letter was so disturbing is because in, in all his documents, he, he had, they had subtleties that cast doubt on the authenticity of the church, was because there was actually uh, a detractor of the church in the 1800s who claimed that Joseph Smith had told him that there was a white toad oh, yeah. affecting, oh, yeah. affecting the golden mm -hmm. plates. And so the Salamander letter suddenly... It did. We he did. had enough proof with enough falsity that it, the whole thing just became this murky, murky place, and nobody had enough knowledge, really. He had more knowledge than most people. Well, he, he, <laughs> He, he forged simple documents that caused huge problems. He forged a land deed between Sidney Rigdon and Solomon Spalding. It's just a simple land deed. It means they own property together. But what it did is it renewed this theory that Solomon Spalding had had contact with the early members of the church. And Solomon Spalding was a reverend in Maine or, Ma or Maryland who mm -hmm. wrote a book, a novel, about Israelites right. coming to Europe right. to to North America and going back. And it, this theory that Joe Smith had copied his novel as a basis for the Book of Mormon had long since been discredited, but this land deed suddenly renewed this theory that the Book of Mormon had copied from it, yes. his novel. Yes. Do, you have, do you have any, do you have any, uh, uh, any data that shows that every single thing that he did forge had something to do with some rumor? Was it always some rumor that it was tied in with? I mean, is that where his genius was? Well, well, originally, the first thing he ever forged was, was a token to Lagoon. One of the original tokens <laughs> to Lagoon. And then he sold it to the Iron Lagoon for $1,000. And uh, he, he, at first, there weren't these earth shattering forgeries. But right, the, he did it very carefully. All of his lower forgeries, once his skill was developed, mm -hmm. were, we, you know, we have to take a quick break. Um, okay. Stay, stay with us. We'll be, we'll be right, right back. We're going into Linda Strasburg. Trey Blue 49, she got sick at the last minute and had to leave. We're going to follow yeah. Mark Hoffman's case. Yeah, Mark Hoffman's case. Live 855. Yeah, Pro Bowl 4, 7, 5, 5, 5. We'll be right back. We've got Becky and Carl on the line. Talking about Mark Hoffman. Word, interviews, and interactions on K Talk. AM 630 KTKK. Come join us at the Best Looking Cotton Tree Inn in Sully. Whether it's a romantic getaway in one of our honeymoon suites or a weekend family outing in the relaxing bar 24 hours pool and hot tub, everyone will be sure to enjoy our full hot breakfast. Here's with eggs, hash browns, Belgian waffles, French toast, food, tasters, and much more. 
They also offer fresh baked cookies, free hot to wireless internet, a fitness center, and shuttle service. They are conveniently located by many shopping centers and numerous restaurants. Call for your reservations today, 801-523-8484. That's 801-523-8484. Be sure to mention the K-Class Radio Listener Special Discounted Rate of $69. Best Western Hot and Tree Inn is located at 106-955 Mile Drive in Sandy. 801-523-8484. Call for your reservations today. 801-523-8484. That's 801-523-8484. Hello, I'm Linda Bills with Keller Williams Realty. You've heard our radio ads about the Simple Selling Solution, which offers you flexible commissions and the right to fire me if you're not satisfied. But wait, there's more. I guarantee that I will sell your home in 30 days or less, or I will pay you up to $10,000. What else can I say? A good realtor walks you through every step of your sale or purchase. A great realtor does that, plus guarantees to sell your home or pays you up to $10,000. The bottom line is, if you are guaranteed that your house will sell through us, you'd be crazy not to use the Linda Bills team. Want to find out more? Call me, Linda Bills, 347-3384. Our system is your solution. Linda Bills, 347-3384. This promotion is available for a limited time only, and some conditions apply. One more time, 347-3384. Would you like to earn a guaranteed 6.7% on your money with no state income tax? Would you like a more secure financial future? Hear the truth about investing. Tune in to Joe Battaglia on the American Advisor, Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. right here on KPAR. Listen daily to learn the fundamentals of investing so you can protect your family from losing stock and a falling dollar. You will learn what's happening to the economy, how to create a diversified portfolio, and how to prosper in any market environment. Joe also provides valuable information on 401k and other retirement accounts and provides practical advice on protecting the purchasing power of your savings account. Call in and you'll receive a free silver coin. Tune in to the American Advisor with your host, Joe Italia, Monday through Friday at 3 o'clock, right here on KPOP, the voice of Utah. Welcome back. I'm Stephen Reinhardt. Those of you from Strasbourg, I host a show from 1 to 2 o'clock on Saturdays where we explore historical, political, cultural, and religious topics that concern the state of Utah. And at the last minute, Linda lost her voice. I'm here with Trevor Buford. We're flying in for me today doing a follow-up on our show earlier where we interviewed Alan Dale Roberts, author of Salamander, the story of the Mormon forgery murders. We're talking about Mark Hoffman. It was the 20th anniversary of his conviction a couple of months ago, one of the most bizarre episodes in Utah history, and frankly, one of the most bizarre episodes in the, in the history of the U United States. His forgeries didn't concern just Mormonism. He sold things to the Library of Congress, to other museums, forged George Washington documents, Abraham Lincoln documents, Mormon documents, Egyptian papyrus coins, money. Are you still with us, uh, Becky? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm fascinated. And I, I'm thinking, um, yeah, he did so many things, not just the church, but how clever. It, it would be a plan of Satan's, wouldn't it, to, uh, you know, to have this man be a genius over so many things. Mm -hmm. And then lose the church into I mean, that's just my feeling, because, because look, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, in Mormon church, you receive a testimony or witness to, for your faith, we're told in the Book of Mormon that you read and you get a witness. And when you get a witness, it changes your life. And But it's all based on faith. And so when he comes up with these documents, I mean, I can see why good members of the church were, were fascinated and intrigued and, and wanted to know and then when they heard these things. I can understand how fearful some became that, you know, if you don't have the faith, that's the scary part. And this is what my friend, who was seminary teacher, uh, because he was called in on the case, and um, he, you know, it, it, you had to have a strong test. Well, yeah, I was talking to Steve about that. I mean, it's amazing that people would think that one little document could 
maybe throw off the testimony of hundreds or even thousands of members of the church. Oh, there are, it was just enough talk with the church trying to buy it and, and not people not knowing all the hands that changed and so on. You know, it makes you think, well, is there a cover? Is there this? I mean, I could see everything. You had that question asked earlier, is, is why is the church involved in buying documents like that? Um, and, and the truth is, the church buys every document that relates to its history and gets its hands on. Of course it does. Good or bad. It, it doesn't really... Uh, try to determine whether they're authentic. It's not that business. It's just in the business of buying them. I'm sure, I know that's true, and I think that's true of many organizations in the world. And, I, you know, that part didn't bother me. But what amazed me was how how wide, how deep his deception became, how many people he defrauded, it. And, of course, the, the senseless, you know, killings. I mean, it, he really was rich. <laughs> he really was. He murdered. I mean, uh, Oh, well, I don't, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, you know, we try not to get into topics of demonic possession and... Oh, I know, and I'm not saying that. Certainly, certainly he was evil. You can talk about that. He had a dark side that was... And so, such a genius, too. There's no question about it. But it's probably one of the most fascinating uh, cases that in my life. I'm on 65 and, you know, lived here all my life. Well, one of the that. things that was interesting about him was his... Uh, prolific findings. I mean, he just seemed to find one thing after another uh, after another. Uh, didn't seem like anybody else in the history of our nation has ever found that many of yeah, those yeah. types of documents. Let's get the we're, we're forging them. <laughs> yeah, he was too, he was too successful. It was happening too much and too often. And he, he, and really, he could have got he, he would have got away with it if he didn't. He would have had a little scandal. I'm afraid he would have. That's why you know I'm so thankful. But he did make a mistake and got blown up and the whole thing. Is he still alive? He is. He's in prison serving life sentence. He's mm -hmm. in Draper. And uh, he, he actually is not serving life without parole, but the Utah Parole Board has made it clear they don't intend to ever parole him. He does not have a, a parole date set any time within the next 100 years. But he's tried to come Are you still visiting? What's that? Do you have a family that visits him? I understand that he does. I think his parents are still alive. His, mm -hmm. his wife was named Dory. She divorced him 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Apparently, he tried to commit suicide after she divorced him, and then he's tried a couple of times to commit suicide in the prison. Although, Alan Roberts, who we had on earlier, huh? said that he thinks those were not genuine suicide attempts. There were more attempts just to... Uh, Unfortunately, to, with, with Mark Hoffman, you never believe anything, hardly. Yeah. I mean, you just... You wonder, you know, what's real and what isn't. I guess we'll never know. And, and that's what that's what uh, Alan said is that his, his deceptions continue to the extent that he can. He can probably to the very end from, from prison. Yeah. Well, I thought the justice. No man knows my history. I'm gonna tell you, Mark Hoffman. No one knows his either. He is a very strange and bizarre. This has been such a fascinating program. I'll get off the phone so you can talk to the. Thank you so much for the call, We're happy that you're listening and happy okay. happy meeting with you. Well, same to you. Thank you. Bye bye. Let's go to uh, Rick on line three. He wants to talk about one of Hoffman's more infamous forgeries, at least outside of Utah. Okay, this one would have been a big one. Rick, you with Yeah, how are you doing? Good. Hey, thanks for coming to play How are you? Uh, really good. Very interesting topic. Uh, for, I'll make a couple points. First one is uh, I think the church has so many controversial documents in their vault that they kind of set themselves up for this. They were an easy target. Uh, just the fact that they, instead of being really candid with what's in there, you know, they always try to put uh, uh, a good spin on it, a good face on it, where it might not be what the real case is. We don't know. I mean, and we don't know what they have in there. We have a lot of stuff in there that. Uh, yeah, and, and a lot, of, and a lot of it, a lot of it is, is not real consistent with what the current storyline is. So it's hard to, you know, justify. And again, that's what made them an easy target for Hoffman. But the question I had is, uh, I've always been interested as to how he forged the oath of a free man. I mean, to my understanding, there was no known uh, replication of this document. There wasn't really anything that said what it looked like or anything. How would he have done that so perfectly? Well, people, everybody. we don't know today how he did some of the forgeries. Now, they can tell most of his documents are forged. Um, they don't know how he did the handwriting still, how he forged that so perfectly. They still don't know a few of the things. I asked the, the speaker who we had on last hour, Alan Roberts, if the oath to Freeman was his 
most perfectly crafted forgery, and he disagreed. He said, no, it wasn't. But most people, including George Strathmore, the forensics expert who analyzes these documents, believe that the oath of the Freeman was his most uh, carefully crafted forgery. Let me just give a quick background information on it, and I'll tell you about it. The oath of the Freeman was supposedly the first document ever printed in the United States of America, in North America, on a, on a printing press that was brought over on the Mayflower. Uh, it's a document that's never turned up. It doesn't exist. I mean, it existed at one point hundreds of years ago, centuries ago, probably the last one disappeared. A few of them were printed. That press, there are a couple of documents from it uh, that exist, but the type setting was changed on the press, and no one really knows what the oath of the Freeman was about. It seems to have just been, a, I think, and I'm really not an expert, but I think it was some sort of declaration that these these uh, you know, the Mayflower people were uh, were free. Well, Hoffman forged it to the point that some of the letters matched the, the typesetting on other documents known to have been from that press. The paper was perfect. The ink was perfect. Every possible way that you could look at this document. How did he know where to say that? Well, just the fact that he even knew uh, that this document had once existed shows a, 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 a very good familiarity with, with American history. And he, he had a fascination with Americana, but Throckmorton, who, who is the expert in analyzing these documents, says that he's he, they still can't tell that the oath of Freeman is a forgery, were it not for the for the stuff they found uh, in his basement and things that, that show that he forged it. They still can't tell. Even the ink on that one is is perfect. Wow. Like I said, I can't remember exactly what it said, but he was concerned. He had a he had a. What was the what was the delay on the Library of Congress in purchasing that? Why why did they hesitate at the last? Was it just budgetary constraints, or did they have some suspicions? Um, it, um, we, I, sorry, I'm sorry about that. We had a little technical difficulties here. What happened is the Library of Congress, I think they started having doubts at the last minute, right before they were going to deliver the money over the authenticity. And also, another thing that happened that disturbed them, Hoffman uh, printed another oath of the Freeman. So the Library of Congress arranged to purchase it for a million and a half dollars, believing it was the only one in existence. And then after they had made this arrangement, before they delivered the money, Hoffman suddenly claimed to have a second copy of it. But she then proceeded to make a deal to sell for a million dollars to someone else. And so suddenly, there's two of them instead of one. It's not quite as valuable. And I think that they were planning on trying to renegotiate the price because of that, that reason. That's my understanding. And I am not an expert. I just interview the experts. But this is what I've gathered from in the interviews that I've conducted. Interesting. Well, it's fascinating. I, you know, the guy who said he wasn't very bright, uh, you, you know, I think Hoffman had to have been a genius, kind of like Einstein. You know, Einstein couldn't remember his home phone number, and he didn't do well in school. So how they do in school is not an indicator of necessarily how bright they are. I think he had to have been a genius. Well, yeah, he was a savant of types, I guess, I mean, with history and, and, and the way documents work. I mean, he, Steve, you mentioned to me he even had like the right type of birch tree from England to well, and produce the ink? Yeah, like certainly it's, it's interesting because you, you, in, in life we measure people by the grades they get in school, and that's really not an accurate measure of their intelligence. Right. In most of the cases. As a matter of fact, some of the brightest people in this world, Einstein, you know, filled out a lot of his courses when he was in school. And right. other, other, other geni geniuses or genii, I guess is what you call them, when thorough genius, but... Uh, uh, and he, he, he was no different. And I thought that was an interesting comment as well. The guy who called himself in high school, and he thought he was an idiot. Yeah. But uh, he I run like a fox. I'm like a fox. And like, like Trevor just said, like, they analyzed the soul of the Freeman and found that the paper had been created from, I think, even like the right type of wood from wow. England. That would have been brought over on the Mayflower, and he yeah. flashed this paper. And, yeah. And so, anyway, um, that's, that's make the way. Story. what else we have out there that's forged? Thanks for the call, Rick. We appreciate right. it very much. Thank you, guys. Good job. Bye-bye. Thanks for that. It, it does make you wonder. I mean, it does make you wonder that, I mean, could, that, that, could the original, uh, we have a Constitution, you know, sitting, a copy of the Constitution, a copy of the Declaration sitting in the National Archives. Uh, from my understanding, the Declaration of Independence, you know, was, was a find from the 1800s. It, 
they didn't know where it went after a while. And, and see, I, I don't know all about that. I do know that they that there was 13 original duplicate copies of the Declaration of Independence. They sent the Declaration of Independence to several people, France, England. And so the copy they have there is one of the originals. It's not the original. There was not just one original. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, all this stuff is fascinating. There's, there's, it's interesting. There's so many forgery stories that relate to you, Tommy. You even have the Howard Hughes will, which was in the 70s, this huge deal. Was this thing forged? And I remember there being all these people that were arguing in, uh, that, uh, that, that it wasn't forged because they said they had the notepad that it came from. And after people had been arguing and doing forensics tests forever, someone realized that the will was on line paper and the notepad they were claiming that it came from didn't even have line paper line line. So it's like they're doing these forensic stuff and they just completely missed like the most obvious the thing. Glaring, yeah. example of the, the error. And for what it's worth that that will, in my opinion, in most people's opinions, was authentic. The guy court declared it wasn't just because they didn't want the money to go to some unknown person in Utah, but it seems to be Frank Abagnale, who came through Utah, and he was an incredibly good forger. He forged all those checks. Yeah, from yeah that's another that's another interesting twist. I mean, the guy who, catch me if you can, really catch me if you can, about the guy who forged those checks. He claims in his book that he was a BYU professor for a while, that he forged his credentials and taught history at BYU. Uh, BYU thought that was interesting and looked into it, and uh, they have no evidence that he taught there, even under the alias that he says that he did. So you almost wonder a little bit if his book isn't his biggest con. Like, is he actually... Yeah, well, exaggerating things is book. He picked some obscure school in the state. He didn't think that a lot of people to claim that he taught it. He was like, a bad choice. There's a lot of people that go to that school. It's like 30,000 uh, uh, students. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think anybody really cares whether he's lying or not. He just wants to sell his book and make a movie. But no, he did a, did a good job of that. It's, it's all just, yeah, it's all just fascinating, fascinating stuff. There was a, uh, I, don't know, I think there was a big roof. A rookie card or something that they just discovered was a forgery just uh, just a few weeks ago. Some guy they, they, they still float around up there. Uh, and I don't think that actually had anything to do with Utah. I guess I'm kind of digressing onto a tangent, but um, you know, Hoffman certainly did, and, and he forged all sorts of documents. There's a book if you're if our listeners are interested called The Part in the Murderer by Simon Simon Worrell. And it was written by a guy on the East Coast about Mark Hoffman. It doesn't it gets into a little bit his, his forgeries that relate to Mormon documents, but more it focuses on the investigation that discovered that his Emily Dickinson poem was forged. I kinda of wonder had Hoffman not committed the murders if he would have gone down as one of the greatest white collar criminals. Rather than just got in being just a regular murderer. I mean, because that's did, really what did the murderers make him that much, his crimes that much more prominent. I, was there ever a conviction delivered for the forgeries? I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure there would have been had he not murdered people. I mean, he wouldn't have gotten away with that one once they discovered it. Um, but there is a movie, interestingly enough, being made about this Emily Forged Emily Dickinson poem. It's not about Hoffman himself, but it's about this investigation. A curator at a museum who starts to suspect that this poem from Emily Dickinson may have been forged by this uh, crazy genius in this obscure state called Utah who's serving life in prison, and they investigate it and find out that it is, and this poem's been published in her books, and people have assumed that it's, that it's legitimate for, for years, and it wasn't even written by someone who even had an education in English. Probably got their English doctorate based on a dissertation. Yeah, you know, there's, some, yeah, you know, there's probably like Yale scholars, and I'm just, I'm just speculating, you know, they probably wrote synthesis essays about how wonderful this poem was and how it relates to her, to her other works, who knows. But it's all just, it's all just fascinating stuff. So he didn't just uh, embarrass the church, he embarrassed a lot of people, including Harvard, who tried to translate his anthem transcript, which was forged. Let's... Uh, we, we're, we're winding up the hour here. Trevor Booth and I and Stephen Reinhardt have been telling you from Linda Strasburg today. Her show's interviews. It, it, I, it, 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 yeah. And uh, she was here. She got sick at the last minute. So we're just doing a follow-up on our Mark Hoffman interview from the hour before. We interviewed uh, Alan Dale Roberts. His interview will be on StephenReinhardt.com. This is K-Talk. We want to wish everyone a happy new year. Thank you for listening to the program. I'll be on uh, every Saturday. I may, I may have a buy next Saturday, but we discuss interesting historical issues. We're going to be talking about D.B. Cooper probably in, in two Saturdays from now. We hope to have an interview yeah, with Judge right. David Winter, District Court Federal Judge, who's decided in. Strasburg interviews and interviews on K-Talk.
AM 630 KTKK. Remember the fun you 